Hello, I want to do an introduction screenshot, screencast about the uh, message flow, major components, and how we use middleware in the Marino Collective. First, we need to deal about with connectivity. In a traditional system like Capistrano, you would basically have your workstation running a multi threaded program that attempts to connect directly to every node. Now this puts a lot of strain on your on your workstation. You're basically orchestrating all of the traffic flow between the machines. You need to have direct access to all of the machines. You need to use something like SSH, all of the encryption, all of the work happens there. And in the case of Capistrano, that happens in Ruby, which is not such a great multi-threaded language. So you typically find that by 20 or 30 nodes, you start running into problems. So Dealing with large number of, of machines and sending traffic to them really quickly is a problem that the banking industry and the stock exchanges has already dealt with. And they do this using tools called middleware or message oriented middleware. Now there's a lot of tools in the space, commercial ones like Tipco, and in the recent recent few years there's been quite a few open source ones, things like ActiveMQ, RabbitMQ, and there's a little standardization happening in the middleware space. Now, we've, we've decided to, to use these tools since they are basically purpose-built, really, really fast message tra transfer tools. Basically, if I put one message into the workstation, the middleware is, it's the, it's the middleware starts to distribute this message to all of the nodes. It does this very quickly, if you can look at some benchmarks on the internet, you'll find that uh, numbers such as two or three hundred thousand messages per second is not unheard of. So how does this work? When we basically create a request from our workstation for the status of the HTTPD service on all the machines, I would put one single message onto the middleware. The middleware would then have an internal track that says how many machines are actually involved in is interested in this traffic specifically and it would then push that traffic to those machines the machines wouldn't be polling they wouldn't be asking for a message every second or whatever the middleware pushes the information to the nodes and therefore it happens extremely fast extremely low overhead on the nodes when the nodes then reply they individually send a message the middleware sends me a stream of the messages down to my workstation, again using a push methodology. Um, thereby, all of the hard work of shifting the traffic between workstation and nodes is completely out of my hand. I don't need to re-implement this very complex piece of software. You can also cluster your middleware. You can have multiple nodes. You can have two middleware nodes in every data center or once per country or one in your NOC and one in every data center. It's very, very flexible. Uh, lots of scaling opportunity and lots of uh, security opportunity in reusing these tools. So just a quick digression in the kind of messages people send over the middleware. There are basically two and the typical thing that you hear about on when people talk about message middleware, it is more about queuing, where you essentially have a FIFO where some kind of a producer would put in jobs, one, two, three, and the jobs would be distributed to your nodes and they would do the work. But still, every message will only be delivered once to one node only, and thereby you effectively scale your workload across multiple nodes. We don't, at the moment, use such a acute based approach. We use a topic based approach, which you saw earlier, where the middleware broadcasts the messages out. This is called sometimes publish subscribe, sometimes in the in active MQ language, it's called a topic. Okay, so having a look at the various components of software you need to install, the machines, the terminology, and all the various players. If you look at the basic picture here that we've seen before, this is your, your your general setup. You have a workstation, middleware, and a bunch of servers. Now, we call our physical servers and your Red Hat operating system nodes. 
and on every node you would run the two RPMs you see at the bottom, M Collective and M Collective Common. On every node runs a server. This is a daemon written in Ruby, and every node that you wish to manage needs to run the server. This is also contained in the M Collective RPM. Then inside the server runs a number of agents, things like service managers, package managers, process managers, and the server will host a number of these things. It's kind of analogous to, say, Tomcat hosting a number of web apps. And finally, we've got the client component. The, this is any machine that needs to send a request to servers. And when you want to do that, you need to have the of client installed. And that comes in a separate RPM. Now, the lines of the client sometimes blur a little bit because Servers might also need to send requests if you enable things like replicate um, registration, uh, but that's that's kind of an advanced topic for now. Just consider that a client is where you want to be managing your system from. Now, as I said, you we're using the the middleware, and if you combine all of these things together, you get a collective. This is nodes, servers, agents, middleware, clients, and some other plugins all combined into a collective. The one thing I didn't mention is how we're actually communicating with the middleware. Um, it's a plugin, um, so you might have ones for RabbitMQ, you would have ones for ActiveMQ, maybe one for a commercial queuing system. Or, or, um, at the moment, the one that's most supported is Stomp, and you would basically install the RubyGem Stomp on any machine, any node, on all your clients, anywhere you need to communicate with the middleware. You need to install the Stomp gem and you need to configure it to use to talk to your middleware. Configuration might mean usernames, passwords, um, some little structure of the messages, and even things like failover pools and so forth. Okay, so we've covered the major components, all of the software and so, and I'll quickly show how we actually construct the actual messages that goes from client to server and back. Now you might remember from the introduction or from using M Collective that we do a two-phase approach. Since we're completely decentralized, there's no database of active nodes, it's all based on discovery. We need to first, if we want to do this command at the bottom of the screen, HTTP status for machines just in South Africa, we don't upfront know how many machines we have in South Africa. We don't upfront know how long those machines will take to respond. So I've devised a request that's extremely quick. Basically, Discovery will send a full round trip request to every node with the folder attached, and they will respond only the ones matching the folder. I keep a track of which ones have responded to the Discovery request. I then send the actual service status request and then I wait either for the total timeout or until I've had responses from all the machines that I've discovered. And at the end, if I haven't had all the responses, I can give you a little report saying, well, I discovered 10 machines, but only eight of them checked in. And these are the two that didn't check in. Okay. So a discovery message and, and really all, all messages resemble this, but this is a discovery message the first phase phase of the transaction we create a new request and it has a request id um, you'll later on see the reply comes with the same id back the target here slash topic slash m collective dot discovery dot command that is a topic that active mq understands and it knows how to route this and basically the m collective part is our unique collective name Discovery is the agent name, and command is just it's a, it's a channel where the discovery agent receives his commands. We attach a filter. As you can see, there's a filter. It supports identity, agent, classes, etc. And the key one here is that we've got fact, country, equal, date, day, and just below also agent equals service. So when a node or a server receives this message, it will validate the filter and only respond to this package if it's determined that the folder applies to that specific node. 
And what does it do? Well, the body says ping. So it's probably going to say pong back to us. This is the reply. I'm not going to go through all of the details, but you can see there's a request ID which matched our previous request. Um, it tells you it comes from the discovery agent. There's a body called pong. tells you which machine has sent it. And you can see there's a predictable topic name. So as you can imagine, simply responding with the word pong to a request for ping is extremely quick. I aim for a round trip time of around 40 to 50 milliseconds. This would be the overhead in network, overhead encryption, over, overhead in encoding the messages, sending them over, MQ, over active MQ and so forth. All of that overhead is somewhere in the region of 40 milliseconds. And that shouldn't go up significantly as you approach, say, a thousand nodes. The only cost would be network latency and so forth. Of course, the message as you're seeing here is not verbatim as I travel over there. We do serialize them. We do do some SSL encryption. This hash at the bottom here would be a cryptographic hash of the message. Um, so all of those things adds a little bit of overhead. Okay, so we've basically received a discovery response here. We might re receive one or a hundred of these and we would just record how many of them we've had. Now we're sending the actual RPC request for the server status. Again, you'll see the folder is identical to the folder that was sent in the discovery phase of the, of the request. There's Now the topic is still M collective, still the same collective, but now we're talking to the service agent and therefore there's a unique topic for the service agent and command is where the service agent gets command from. And we have the body of the request here. And we can see we want to talk to the service agent. We want to get status action for the service HTTPD. So it's very simple stuff. These are just hashes. I specifically use plain old Ruby hashes in order to keep the door open for, for using other languages like Perl or Python or C or whatever. Um, and we will use something like YAML to serialize this information into a message. Now, the body, uh, by convention, I'm using a hash, but you can use anything and any data that you put in there, even if it's not a standard primitive, even if it's a complex object, your own object, something like a, a active record reply, a, a result set, whatever, that will travel through M Collective and come out the other side intact. It will deserialize to the exact same type that you've put in. Our RPC framework adds a bunch of convention and it basically says you're going to be sending a hash, but you could put complex data inside the members of the hash. Now we've sent the request, so here comes the reply. You'll see the request ID is again the same as before. There's a new body. The body will be the status of the HTTPD service and there's a little bit of structured data in there say this code, say this message and whether or not it's running and you can see there is a different again the target is a service reply sender id is my machine so we'll be receiving a number of these we will wait for as many of the nodes that we've discovered and once we have them all we will just say we're done and we'll exit with the request so that's where that's basically the general flow of a request discovery request discovery reply and finally an rpc request and rpc reply like i said these data structures that you've seen here match very closely what goes over the wire not exactly because there's some hashing and some extra information in here that i've taken out for for um they don't really make a difference to the screencast but the the data that travels are all simple hashes, nothing complex, and we should in theory be able to hook up different programming languages onto this. Okay, that is the end of the presentation. Thanks for your time.